Now, I know it's Thanksgiving weekend, and, and some of you are here, and uh, you may be with some of your friends whom you've invited and family, and you're perhaps expecting an upbeat, inspiring message away from all of that doom and gloom of Romans. Isn't that going through some of your minds? But we're continuing in Romans. <laughs> And in fact, not only we're continuing in Romans, this morning we come uh, to what some commentators say, and I think I agree, that this is one of the most difficult passages in Romans. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. It's not easy to understand, and it's certainly not easy to preach, and I'm sure all of you will agree with that after the message. What I am going to ask that you listen carefully, that you try to follow, as I prayed, that you're not distracted. And can I ask you to do that? And can I also ask you to do a very difficult thing for some of you? If you've got a smartphone, or for that matter, any kind of phone, can you put it off? I was reading this week an article about the uh, smartphone, iPhone, that there are many, many people that take the iPhone to their bed. It's the last thing they look at at night, and the first thing they look up in the morning. In fact, if they wake up during the night, uh, they don't read their Bible, they look at their iPhone. Now, some of you say, well, we've got our Bible on our iPhone, but how would I know when you're looking at that iPhone whether you're looking at the Bible or whether you're checking your Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever? I mean, how would I know that? In the article, I read that by 2012, over 50% of Americans own a smartphone. I do. It's very easy, isn't it, if you've got the Bible on your iPhone to go from that to social media. Gene Twench is a professor of psychology at San Diego State University. Uh, as far as I know, she's not a believer. But in this article, which was published recently in Atlantic, she said that the arrival of the smartphone has radically changed every aspect of a teenager's life. And she's done extensive study on this. I think it's changed all of our lives, hasn't it? She writes, beginning with millennials and continuing with what she calls the I generation, that's the, the generation that's grown, grown up with the iPhone, Adolescence is contracting again. 18-year-olds now act more like 15-year-olds used to, and 15-year-olds more like 13-year-olds. Childhood now stretches well into high school. Some would argue into college. They're on their phone, in their room. And then she says, alone and often distressed. Teens who spend more time than average on screen activities are more likely to be unhappy. This is a secular article. And those who spend more time than average on non-screen activities are more likely to be happy. And she's saying it's time we put the iPhone off, go out for a walk, play a sport, or do anything. Smartphone, hasn't it? It's changed all of our life. Wonderful thing to have. I must confess, I like my smartphone, but with it, there's this terrible danger that we are living our life in an iPhone rather than interacting with people. Now, I have, my, I have a Bible on the iPhone. It's great, very convenient when I'm traveling. But I think nothing can enjoy actually reading this book. Now, I realize for the I generation are going to think, you're old, you're brought up in books. I do. I still love books. But this is the best book to read, the Bible. So can I encourage all of us, not just their students, not just their children, but all of us, can I encourage us to spend more time reading this book than on our smartphone, to spend less time in the smartphone and more time actually reading the Bible. So try it this week. When you're tempted to go onto social media, take a break and do something which will please God and open this book. It has transformed my life. This book says it will make you wise unto salvation. It is, says the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 105, it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In a dark world, in a confusing world, we need clarity. We need wisdom. And this comes from reading and obeying this book. So if you didn't bring your Bible with you, there's one in the pew in front of you. And if you can't find Romans 3, it's on page 940, as we look at this rather difficult passage, which will require concentration. I was reading last night, and I came across uh, this quote 
You'll excuse me if I say he's Scottish. It was a Scottish preacher, Charles J. Brown, who lived from 1806 to 1884. And this is what he says about the Bible. He says, observe how it is with the newborn baby. It thirsts by the power of an irresistible instinct after its mother's milk, the destined food and nourishment of its infant life. Just so it is with a heaven-born soul and with the newborn revived church. Remember Peter says in 1 Peter 2 that we're to desire the sincere milk of the Word, meaning the Bible, so that we would grow just as a baby longs for the mother's milk, so we are to long for the Word of God. And this writer, Charles Brown, is saying when that happens, the church is revived. It says the church thirsts by the force of a resistless spiritual instinct after the sincere milk of the Word, the food and nourishment of the immortal soul. Now, can you say that's true of you, that you have this irresistible thirst to hear from God? He goes on to say, in dead souls and dead churches, there is nothing even approaching to a thirst for the preaching of the Word. Now, he's writing at the end of the 19th century, a long time ago. He says, the people come to the house of God not to satisfy an appetite, but to discharge a duty. The most solemn and affecting truths fall powerless on their ears. There's no meltings, no subduings of soul under them. They are scarce listened to without impatience unless there be something remarkable and exciting in the style and manner of address. Very possibly, he says, eloquence may moisten the eyes and touch the feelings of the people, but the most effective truths of God fail of reaching their hearts. He says the whole of this is reversed in a revived, a living church. Now, what's going to characterize a living church? We all want to be part of one, don't we? He says, the souls of the people there are open at once to the Word of God. They melt and bend beneath the simple truths presented in the simplest Scripture dress. Every opportunity is eagerly embraced. New opportunities are desired and longed for. He said, the Word is drunk in with an affinity and delight. That's a characteristic, isn't it, of the growing believer that we long to hear from the Word of God. I hope you come this morning with such a thirst for Scripture. Now, as we look at the first eight verses of Romans chapter 8, uh, Paul, from starting from verse 18 of chapter 1 through verse 20 of chapter 3, he portrays a court scene. And there's three principal parties, I think. There is the judge, there is the prosecutor, and there is the defendant, the accused. God is the judge, Paul is the prosecutor, and you and I are the defendant, we're the accused. And Paul, the prosecutor, has brought the pagan man, the moral man, the religious man, and even the Jewish man into the courtroom. And uh, the prosecutor's case, Paul, has been masterful, it's been devastating argument by argument with all of the skill of a brilliant logician and having mastered every facet of the case, Paul the prosecutor has exposed every single person, the pagan, the moral person, the nice guy, the religious person, and even the Jew, all have been exposed. He's pointed out that pagan Gentiles, while they don't have the law, they are without the law, he says, but they have a witness. They've got the witness of creation. Chapter 1, verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Look up at the sky. Look at a rose. Look at a baby. The evidence for God is self-evident. And Paul also says, you've got the witness of the law of God written on your heart. And so his conclusion is, chapter 1, verse 20, they are without excuse. And then he zeroes in on the Jew who has the law of God. He's very different from the pagan Gentile. This man has the Mosaic law, ah, but he's also without excuse. He has many privileges, it's true. He's got the Mosaic law, but he doesn't obey the law. Paul has said that having the law and even being circumcised don't exempt Jews from the judgment of God. Every single person, this is Paul's argument, Every single person in the world, without exception, has this in common. All stand in need of the righteousness of God. And we looked at some of the principles of divine judgment 
Let me remind you in chapter 2, verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Now I can picture the courtroom being hushed with a sense that the case is almost completed. The tension mounts. The judge is about to pass his verdict on the defendants. But just before the verdict is given, one of the defendants speaks up. He's got something to say, and he's not at all happy with the case presented by the prosecutor, Paul. This defendant is Jewish, and he does not accept that receiving the Mosaic law and receiving circumcision do not exempt him from the judgment of God. In fact, this Jew is profoundly offended at Paul putting himself, a Jew, and a Gentile on equal footing. Is Paul really saying that being Jewish has no advantage? The man can hardly believe what Paul is saying. And so before the verdict has passed, as we'll see next week, Let's listen to the final arguments as set out in the first eight verses of Romans 3. Undoubtedly, Paul has heard these arguments before. Paul is a very formidable debater. Remember, he goes into the synagogue, and he's preached in the open air, and he's been heckled. He's been shouted at. If any of you have ever spoken in the open air, as I, I have done in my past, you've got to deal with a heckler, don't you? Uh, they may be a little… Uh, intoxicated. They may be angry. If you've ever been part of a debate, you know that you can be heckled and shouted at, and people give you all kinds of objections. Paul has heard them all as he's traveled in his missionary journeys. And so here, as he writes to the Romans, I think he's putting together some of these final arguments. But is there any merit to these arguments? Will the argument presented by this Jew, will it alter the course of the case. Is it possible that Paul, good prosecutor although he is, that, he's a, that he has omitted some vital point which is going to be fatal to the prosecution, certainly the prosecution of the religious Jew? Because he's saying that the Jew is also under the judgment of God. Is it true that everyone, including the Jew, is under the judgment of God? Is this man going to present some point which is going to nullify Paul's case. Well, let's read, first of all, verses 1 and 2. And the first argument is in the first four verses, and it is this. Paul's, God's faithfulness to Israel nullifies Israel's faithfulness. That's the argument. And it's quite a powerful argument, isn't it? That God who is faithful… is going to deal with Israel differently, even although we accept that Israel is faithless. Now, the Jewish nation has advantages, verse 1. Then, what advantage is the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? You hear the Jew asking the question? Verse 2, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So, listening to Paul, one could get the distinct impression, particularly as we studied Romans 2 for the last few weeks, you could get the impression that being Jewish is no advantage at all. Is Paul, in a cavalier way, throwing out the Old Testament? I mean, what about Abraham? What about the patriarchs? Is Paul really saying that being circumcised is no advantage at all? Isn't that what he appears to be saying? Look back at chapter 2, verse 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. It's the very mark of being a Jew, the outward and physical act of circumcision. So, what are you saying, Paul? What, what advantage has the Jew? What is the value of circumcision? No. Circumcision was part uh, of, of the Abrahamic covenant. We read that in Genesis 17, that the very sign of the covenant, that there was this special relationship 
between God and His people, Israel, was the sign of circumcision. Baby boys were to be circumcised on the eighth day. So, are you saying that's no longer in force, Paul? What are you saying? Does being Jewish have any advantages at all? Paul is very clear, verse 2, much in every way. Yes, of course, being Jewish has many advantages. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Of all of the people who received the law, it wasn't a great nation, it wasn't a big nation, it was a small nation that God entrusted to Israel the very oracles of God. Referring to the Old Testament Scriptures, particularly the Messianic and covenant promises were given to Israel. Yes, Israel is central to the purposes of God. Paul has said in chapter 1, verse 3, that the Messiah was descended from David. He's David's greater son. He's descended from David according to the flesh. Yes, being Jewish does have many advantages, does have many privileges. Turn over to chapter 9, as Paul's going to revisit this in three wonderful chapters, 9, 10, and 11. Romans 9, verse 4. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen." It's amazing, isn't it? This little nation were immensely privileged. Yes, they had many, many advantages. So, here's the argument. If the Jews then are in a special uh, category, your conclusion, Paul, is invalid. It's true, as Paul has argued, that although the Jews had the law, the Jews weren't always obedient to the law. This Jew who is objecting, he can concede that point. But doesn't Paul understand this, that God does not go back on His promises to the Jewish nation, even when Israel is unfaithful? Do you not understand, Paul, that God's faithfulness is not nullified by the unfaithfulness of the Jewish nation? And if you're arguing otherwise, you're attacking the very integrity of God. Seems a powerful argument, doesn't it? Doesn't this undercut, undermine Paul's argument that the Jew is as guilty as the Gentile when the Jew has all of these advantages? He was given the very oracles of God, the very sign of the special relationship between God and Israel was on them. What do we say? Well, we know that God chose the nation of Israel out of all of the nations to be His special people. Turn with me to Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 7, where we will read this. Yes, there's no question that Israel was specially chosen by God. It was God's sovereign choice. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. For you, he's talking to Israel, listen to this, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession. There it is. Out of all of the peoples who were on the face of the earth, think of all of the nations. God could have chosen any one of them, but He chose you, Israel. Verse 7, it wasn't because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set His love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. No, it's not because you're a mighty, impressive nation. You weren't the world's superpower. Quite the contrary, verse 8. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Isn't that marvelous? Yes, it's clear that God, out of love, 
Not because you were great, not because you were huge, but just out of love. It's a covenant-keeping God. He chose Israel. And to that nation, He gave the special sign of His covenant, an enduring covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. He gave the sign of circumcision. So, if Paul is now saying that there's no advantage of circumcision and no advantage in being Jewish, he's obviously wrong. He appears, Paul, to have forgotten the faithfulness of God. God always keeps His promises. God is always faithful, even when we are unfaithful. Is Paul really saying that God has now rejected His people and that there's no difference between the Jew and Gentile? in terms of their, their right standing before God, when God Himself chose the people, and when God doesn't go back on His promises? Verses 3 and 4, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Yes, the Jew admits that many of the Jewish nation were unfaithful, but their unfaithfulness surely doesn't nullify the faithfulness of God. No, by no means, Paul is saying, he, he agrees. God's promises still stands. God is always true to His Word. God is faithful to Israel. And Paul is going to develop that argument very forcibly in Romans 9, 10, and 11. No, God hasn't rejected His ancient people. There's a tremendous future for, for Israel. The Abrahamic covenant still stands. And in the midst of man's sin and unrighteousness, God's righteousness and glory stand in a vivid contrast. Even if everyone lies, God is still true. Our unbelief, our unfaithfulness don't prevent God from continuing to be faithful to His promises. God is 100% reliable, even though every single person is wholly unreliable. Yes, that's true. Paul would agree. But this Jew has forgotten something. Romans 3 verse 4 is a quotation from Psalm 51, verse 4. What's Psalm 51 all about? Psalm 51 is a magnificent prayer of repentance and confession of, Dave, of Israel's greatest king, David. David, at the pinnacle of his power, fell into sin. Not just one sin, but several sins. A very, very serious sin. Sins like adultery, like murder, like covetousness, like lying. There's no question of his sin. He was unfaithful. Great king as he was, a man after God's own heart, but he was unfaithful. He broke several of the commandments of God. Now look back. You see the quotation here in verse 4 of Romans 3, but turn to Psalm 51, and let's read it there. Psalm 51. You're saying, if I had it on my mobile, I'd find it much quicker. Well, that's only because you don't know your Bible well enough. So as you keep using it, your speed is going to improve. Psalm 51. Uh, let me just read from verse 4 this great prayer of confession. And Paul quotes it in Romans 3, verse 4. Against you, David is saying this to God, against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. We agree. That you may be justified in your words, and what in your judgment? And blameless in your judgment. Yes, this Old Testament Scripture does establish that God is proved to be righteous even when His people sin. For example, David. Great example. He is always Psalm 51, verse 4, he's always blameless in his judgment. To the, to the repentant sinner like David, God is always ready to forgive. But God's Word, the oracles of God, also makes it clear that God's judgment comes on the unrepentant and the disobedient. 
Don't just select the part of Scripture that you like, Mr. Jew. This is the point that you're missing. This is the point that we don't like to hear, whether we're Jewish or whether we're professing Christians. That this book, God's Word, which is totally reliable, which is perfect, which is inerrant, this Word contains magnificent promises of God, tremendous blessings that come to us as the people of God. Ah, but the same Word also contains strong warnings, strong warnings. Whether forgiving or whether condemning, God is just in all He does. Verse 4 of Romans 3, let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, Psalm 51 verse 4, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. God prevails and is vindicated in all He does. These privileges which you receive, Mr. Jew, these privileges which you receive, Mr. Calvary Church, bring responsibility. Don't waste these privileges. They will never save you. They must personally drive you to Christ. No one is ever saved, Old Testament or New Testament, because of the religious privileges. Don't think that you're exempt and you can live as you like. Yes, Paul agrees that being Jewish has many advantages, has many privileges. But if they don't drive you to faith in God, you stand condemned. See, what about your response to the privileges God has given to you? Do you think that you're exempt from the judgment of God? Isn't it true that we're a bit like this Jew? Here we are at Calvary Church. We've got the Bible. We've got the heritage. We've got a, a magnificent text for the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. But do we really think because of that we're in a different category from others? Is that really what you're thinking? Many of us sitting here were brought up in a strong Christian home. What a tremendous privilege. Privilege that I have received. A privilege that many of you received. The question is, however, what are you doing with these privileges? Yes, we have the oracles of God. We have the Bible. But are we reading it? Are we studying it? Are we obeying it? Are we telling others about, us, about it? Now notice how Paul continues in verses 5 through 8. Here's the second argument, and it's really a variation of the first. Israel's unrighteousness demonstrates all the more the righteousness of God. A good argument, but it could be perverted, couldn't it? And Paul is going to make it right. Israel's unrighteousness, says this Jew, demonstrates all the more the righteousness of God. Verse 5, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Are you following this? Are you with me here? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then, how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds, abounds to His glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just? You following this? Here's the Jews' argument. All Israel's sin, all Israel's unrighteousness just demonstrates all the more that the Jew will not be judged. But notice what Paul is saying. God is the just judge, whether he is forgiving or whether he is condemning. But the Jew is arguing that God is unjust if his wrath is on Jews. Is the Jew, Paul would respond, is the Jew really arguing that the glory of God is established through a righteous and faithful God, not judging unrighteousness? Are you really saying, as you look at David's sin, a terrible sin, 
A man who had great privileges, great responsibility, a man who knew better, deliberately, repeatedly sinned against God. Are you really saying that as you look at the sin of David, it just highlights the righteousness of God? And so we can say, verse 8, why not do evil that good may come? I mean, just think of the good that came out of David's sin. We see God's righteousness. We see God's forgiveness. We see that His righteousness prevailed. What a wonderful story. And so we could say, let's do evil so that good may come. The argument that God can't punish the sinner as sin makes the righteousness of God all the more glorious is manifestly absurd. Verse 6, by no means. A strong negative statement. The false argument is that if sin advances the purposes of God, it is unjust of God to judge sin. Isn't that a twisted argument? Says Paul, that's slanderous. Some of you are saying that we do that as some people, verse 8, slanderously charge us with saying. This is ridiculous. Verse 7, for then how could God judge the world, if that's what you're saying? And why am I still being condemned as a sinner? No, Paul, nor any of the apostles, nor our Lord Himself never, ever advocates that the people of God, that any people can live as they like. Paul is certainly not advocating what's called antinomianism. I put the word on the screen so that you can see it. Anti against nomos, the law. An antinomian is saying, no law, we can live as we like, no rules, no commands, we can live as we like. God is so gracious, God is so kind, God is so loving that I can live as I like, and at the end of the day, God's going to forgive me. In fact, I can choose to sin knowing that somewhere down the road I can say a little prayer and God will forgive me and everything will be well. Paul's going to expand uh, this subject and his answer in Romans chapter 6. Antinomianism, live as you like. Does that sound familiar? The view, if we put it into Christian terms, the view that followers of Jesus Christ, people who are forgiven by the grace of God or who profess to be forgiven by the grace of God, can live as they like, can do as they like, and it doesn't really matter because after all, God is gracious and God is forgiving. You heard that view? No, we don't need to live according to any standards. That's legalism. Commands. Oh, that's Old Testament. Uh, we live under grace. Why not, verse 8, why not do evil that good may come? I've had people say to me, John, I know what I'm doing is wrong. I know it's sinful, but I'm still going to do it because I believe that at some point I will get in the presence of God and ask His forgiveness. That's a dangerous dangerous situation, isn't it? But preachers of the free grace of God, as I preach, preachers of eternal security, as I believe and preach, we're sometimes accused of advocating a lifestyle of sin. Now that you're saved, now that you're eternally saved, you can live as you like. Why not do evil that good may come? God's righteousness is greater than our unrighteousness. And in fact, the more that we sin, the greater will be God's grace. And Paul's going to expound that at the end of Romans 5 and into Romans 6, but we get a taste of it here. Is that, is that what you think? As you sit here, you're, in, you're involved in sin right now, and you think, oh, yeah, but, oh, grace is wonderful. God's forgiveness is wonderful. God's love is wonderful. For three years, my family and I, we lived in Gibraltar. And when I was 15 years old, my older brother, who was 17 at the time, and myself and some other boys from Gibraltar, 
uh, supposedly under the leadership of an army officer, a British army officer, uh, was going to take us to a Christian camp in Morocco. As it turned out, uh, through his lack of leadership, so much for his leadership skills in the British Army. Uh, a lot of the boys weren't able to get into Morocco to go back to Gibraltar. So my older brother, George, who was 17, just 17, I was 15, and another boy, 15, uh, we had to make our own way in Morocco from Tangier. Some of you have been there. We went over the boat, the Straits of Gibraltar, into Tangier and got a train uh, down to a place called Kenitra. If you've been to Morocco, it's just north of Rabat, uh, the capital. Quite an adventure for us, as you can imagine. And uh, we were going uh, to a place we'd never been before. Uh, George and I had been in Morocco. My, uh, our parents had taken us various vacations into Morocco. We visited a number of missionaries and so on, uh, mainly medical uh, missionaries. So we knew a little bit about Morocco. But there we were on this train heading to a camp um, my father had heard about this camp. It was a camp led by uh, Americans, an American missionary and his family. Now, to show what a deprived childhood I had, I'd never met an American at that point. Can you imagine living 15 years and never meeting an American? And uh, he was having a camp. The camp was free. Now, in our mind, we're going to a free camp. Christian camp is true run by an American. What was our view of Americans? Well, I can't say it all. Uh, <laughs> but we thought of Americans as very outgoing people, uh, not exactly having the British reserve, uh, a little louder spoken than uh, we were used to, um, but also very free and easy. I mean, America was the land of the free, the home of the brave. It was where you could do anything you like. It was America. All these movies and everything. Not that we were allowed to see them, but they were all made in America. And so we arrived at this Kenitra late at night. No one was there to meet us. So my older brother always liked to be the leader, and I, of course, always deferred to him um, sometimes. But anyhow, we got a, we got a taxi. And we arrived at this farm. This man, this missionary man had a, had a farm. And we're met, not by him, his name was uh, Barnett, Mr. Barnett. Uh, we had to get used to his American accent, uh, which we found very quaint. And uh, we're told we're going to sleep in this huge tent, flaps up, rows of beds, and uh, we were the first campers to arrive. We were quite adventure. Dark, didn't know where we were. Woke up in the morning, and the other fellow, Paddy and I, we thought, this is great. We're going to, we're going to explore. We jump out of bed. We're talking. And all of, it, all of a sudden, we hear this voice, lay down, boys. We thought, the voice of God. <laughs> we thought, you know, get back into bed. We thought, you know, we weren't told to get back into bed since we're six years old. I mean, we're 15, 16, 17-year-olds. We thought, what, a, what kind of place is this? Back into bed. Then he started telling us the rules of the camp. We thought, my. And there were, some of them were fairly obvious. Others were a little bizarre. He had four uh, teenage daughters, and he made it very clear to us uh, that there was no mixed bathing. He had, he had a swimming pool. We thought, mixed bathing? I mean, we're a swimming club in, in Gibraltar. This idea that uh, men and women couldn't go into the swim, same swimming pool together, it was, it was bizarre. We thought, you know, have we come into a kind of a, a cult? Are we going to be asked to drink the Kool-Aid next? I mean, <laughs> what, what is this? Some of it was very good. It was free for time I ate corn on the cob. And as the… so it wasn't all bad. <laughs> but as the camp went, this man stood and preached, opened the Scriptures to us. Other campers came, and we found out very soon that this man, for all of his strictness, 
his rules, all of which we didn't understand, although we were brought up very conservatively, but we'd never come across the fact that you couldn't go into a swimming pool with people of the opposite sex. It seemed absolutely unbelievable, but there it was. I guess America uh, had all kinds of people, and we realized that this man loved us, and he cared for us, and he would explain the rules. And in spite of our initial reaction that we'd come to a place which was very, very strict, was going to be run like an army boot camp, we realized that we enjoyed this. And that the more we liked Mr. Barnett with his odd accent, the less and less onerous the rules came. And so as we left that camp after about 10 or uh, 14 days, I think it was. We all said this was one of the best experiences of our life. In spite of the rules, he in his wisdom had thought, I don't know who these boys are coming from Gibraltar, these British and these Scottish people, but I'm going to have these rules. And we realized that these rules, which seemed burdensome, were in fact for our good and were written, as it were, by a man who loved us and who sought our best interests. How do you look on Scripture? Do you look on burdensome? The Bible says God's commandments are not burdensome. You see, the more you love Jesus Christ, you realize that these commandments, which, yes, may seem restrictive to us, particularly which we're, when we're younger, and may seem to box us in, are in fact for our good. And the more that we love Christ, the more we understand the wisdom of Scripture. And the fact that the gospel is free does not mean that we're free to live as we like. And Paul is establishing that the condemnation of the Jew as well as the condemnation of the Gentile is just, and that God has the right to judge His own people, and God has the right to judge the Gentile. And any argument that promotes sin cannot be right, that God's grace never, never encourages us to sin. Can I say, never do evil that good may come? That was the false argument. Why not do evil that good may come? No. You always do what is good out of a love relationship for this Savior who loved us and gave Himself for us. And so the final arguments have ended, and the verdict is awaited, as we will see next week. I ask you as we close, what are your final arguments? What reason are you giving for God not to pass judgment on you? What reason are you giving that you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? What's holding you back? What's your argument? State it. Bring it out. And for those of us who are following Christ, we should welcome these kind of questions so that we can answer them. Let me ask you, those of you who are authentic followers of Jesus Christ, why, in God's name, why are you continuing to go on in that sin? You know it's wrong. You know what that sin in your life is. And you are presuming on the grace of God. We saw that in chapter 2. Do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Yes, God has been very kind. God has been very patient. You deserve condemnation, but God has withheld His judgment on you. Don't presume on that. Today, turn from that. Repent of it. Because at any moment we can stand before a holy God. No, the fact is all of us, no exceptions today, should be on our knees before God, silent and convicted of our sin. Augustine said, O man, consider the greatness of thy sin by the greatness of the price paid for sin. Do you consider the greatness of your sin? Ah, but think of the greatness of the price paid that your sins would be forgiven, the very blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here is hope. Here is transformation. Here is a new life for each one of us, that in Jesus Christ, the wonderful Savior of the world, that He comes, atones on the cross for our sins, as Paul is going to present later in chapter 3, 
that his blood is shed, his precious blood, so that you, whether you're Jewish, whether you're religious, whether you're the worst rascal in North Carolina, all of us may come and receive forgiveness of sin and a new life. So place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing. It's a well-known song about remember. And as we sing it, yes, give thanks for all of the blessings of the past, particularly over Thanksgiving. But use these blessings to promote in you a heart of love and of thankfulness, and that you are not going to presume on the grace of God, but that you're going to live a holy life dedicated to our Savior. Father, we thank you for this passage. It's a little difficult for us. Forgive me, Father, if I, if I got some of this wrong. But I pray that in the power of your Spirit, will you will use the seed sown to bring transformation and renewal. We pray that none of us will presume on your grace. Thank you for that grace, that grace which is greater than our sin, but also that grace which forgives our sins, and that grace which makes us hate our sin and to love Christ. Do your unique work now in our hearts, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.